And I want to thank you, Brian, for uh, taking time out of a very busy schedule. In fact, he finished a book uh, yesterday that I hope he might just say something about. It's very, very important for the things we're about in this chapel today. But anyway, Brian Lortz, pastor of Fellowship Memphis, uh, trustee at Biola University. I think he's doing mission work over there to help them out. But anyway, Brian, we're so glad you came out, and we want to have you come back. Let's welcome him with a Westmont welcome. If you have your Bibles, please meet me in Ephesians chapter 2. And as you're turning there, let me just say that, brother, you was doing your thing on the, the break dancing, man. That was off the chain. I love it. I ain't seen that at a Christian school before, so. Like, y'all ain't had to sign no statement that you wouldn't do that. I love it. Free in Christ. Free in Christ. We got to get that spirit over at Biola. <laughs> Well, y'all got a brother on the clock, and a clock to a black preacher is like kryptonite, so we got to roll. Um, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, pick me up in verse 11. The guy who wrote this, his name is Paul, he says this, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, so sometimes Paul uses the word Gentiles to speak spiritually of those who don't know Christ. Um, he's using that, yeah, partially in that sense here, but more so ethnically to speak of non-Jews, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near not by human effort, but by the blood of Christ. For, speaking of Christ, he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh, underline this phrase, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself, underline this phrase, one new man. In place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God and in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. On Monday, I was really concerned uh, in our teaching time that we look individually, that we must go to war with pride. You and I, outside of the grace of Jesus Christ, are ruthlessly committed to me. And every single day we have to lean on the blood of Jesus. What the scriptures teach, what theologians have affirmed, what great philosophers like C.S. Lewis has likewise affirmed, that the fountainhead to all sin is pride. I, I do what I do because I want to live independently of God. And so Monday we looked at the individual. And we reminded ourselves that me kills we. And that reverse, the humility equals harmony. Today I want to look outside of ourselves. I want to talk about this thing called the church of Jesus Christ. Let me go ahead and say right now in our last 24 minutes together. That many of you, if not most of us, are going to walk out of here after this message and go, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? Christianity is more a tension to be managed. It's going to push you. I, I, I want to I, I disturb your ecclesiology this morning, your doctrine of church, by taking you back to some disturbing truths that Paul lifts up in our text. But before I go any further, would you pray with me? Father, thank you. America is not the center of Christendom. And I thank you for that. Thank you for the reminder that our brothers shared with us. And I affirm it. I read the scriptures and these truths have more direct application and connects to an Eastern world that is communal than it does to an individualized Western culture. And yet the truth, Lord God, is we can't live any of this 
independent of you and your spirit abiding in us. So Lord God, calibrate our ecclesiology, our doctrine of church, and align it with your vision of what church should be. So that end that I'm available to you. In Christ's name, I pray all of these things. Amen. In 1945, Life magazine released a photograph. In this photograph, we, we see a soldier and a woman emphatically embracing one another. In the background, we see... Soldiers embracing other soldiers and civilians embracing other civilians and, and soldiers embracing civilians. And the exchange seems to be so exuberant, so emphatic that, that on just kind of a mere glance, our assumption would be that, that these are individuals who all knew each other and had been reunited together, but on close observation and investigation of this landmark, historic photograph, it was discovered that for the most part, none of these individuals embracing each other so emphatically knew each other. They were complete strangers. So the question on the table is, what would bring complete strangers who had no context for each other, what would bring them together so excitedly in a wonderful picture of community? Well, you know your American history. It's 1945 when this photograph is taken. World War II has just ended and what these people are reacting to is the good news that we had won the war. It was good news that brought complete strangers together in a snapshot of community. The moral of the story, Westmont, is good news should bring people together. I'm here to tell you that prior to 1945, there was even greater news. When on the cross, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died in our place and for our sins. That the good news of the gospel is predicated on the bad news of the gospel. And that is you and I, because of our sins, because of us acting independently of God, we deserved an eternity in hell separated from him. But God, as Tim Keller says, sees us as is, accepts us as is, loves us as is, saves us as is, but by his grace never leaves us as is. That God, as Paul would write in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If, if I was in a chocolate church, we would shout right there that God loves us. My favorite word in Romans 5, 8 isn't God, it's not demonstrated, it's not love. It is the word while. That God did not wait for you and I to clean up our act before he saved us, but he saw us in the midst of our mess. He saw us in the midst of our porn addiction. He saw us in the midst of our gossip. He saw us in the midst of our immorality. He saw us in the midst of our elder brother's self-righteousness and saved us. The truth of the gospel is I don't have to clean up my act in order for God to save me. In fact, I can't clean up my act independent of God. That God demonstrated his love towards us in that while Brian Loritz was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. This is the good news of the gospel. And it is this good news, the Bible speaks loud and clear, that is to gather together an eclectic community of people from all kinds of walks of life, from Compton to, to Montecito, black and white, Asian and Latino. It is the good news of the cross of Jesus Christ that is to bring us together as one. The church of Jesus Christ is not to be some country club where you walk into a church and it's only for the affluent. The church of Jesus Christ is not to be some gang that offers pseudo-community merely to the poor. But the cross of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, is to be a place where rich and poor people of various ethnicities and ages and walks of life come together 
The great tragedy of the church of Jesus Christ today is you can drive down the street and go, that's the Republican church and that's the Democratic church. And I'm here to tell you, God does not ride the backs of donkeys or elephants. He did not come to take, to take sides. He came to take over. God does not sit in heaven watching Fox News or MSNBC or CNN. God is about his kingdom and forming his people. Government is not the hope of the world. If it was, Jesus Christ would have come as a Roman emperor or senator. It is the church of Jesus Christ that is God's hope. The great tragedy of so many people who name the name of Jesus Christ is that they have joined a political party but have not joined his bride. Paul understood that the cross of Jesus Christ was the rallying point that brought people together of different ethnicities, of different walks of life. He was so committed to this that in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 he gives us his missiology when he writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek. Read the book of Acts and notice Paul's missiological methodology. When Paul walks into town, he only has two questions. Where's the synagogue? I want to go to where the Jews hang out and where do the Greeks hang out? If he's in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, he goes to the synagogue first and reasons with them from the scriptures. After that, he goes to the hall of Tyrannus and reasons with the Gentiles. For two years, the text says... If he's in Athens, he goes to the synagogue first, hangs out with the Jews, and then after that, he ventures up to Mars Hill and hangs out with the Greek philosophers of the day. Now that Paul has reasoned together with them and has lifted up Jesus Christ, some Jews say yes to Jesus and some Gentiles say yes to Jesus, now Paul has a problem on his hand. What does he do with these two groups of people who would never do life with one another? Does he start a church on the north side? of town for the Jews and a church on the south side of town for the Gentiles? No. He starts one church. He says, now that you have been vertically reconciled together because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, at the same time, be horizontally reconciled with one another. And that is why, friends, what you need to understand when you read your New Testament, the norm for the church of Jesus Christ, most of the churches Paul started were multi-ethnic churches, where Jews and Gentiles came together. Multi-ethnic is not some new 21st century phenomenon in the church world. It was the norm for the early church. Paul, why were you so committed in seeing Jew and Gentile come together? Look at our text in verse 14. Here's why. Paul says, For he himself, speaking of Jesus, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. The dividing wall is a reference to the temple. If you know anything about the temple, they had four courts. They had the court of Gentiles, then the court of women, then the court of the Israelites, and then the court of priests. In between each of these courts were walls of partition. The dividing wall of hostility was a wall of partition that separated and segregated Gentiles from worshiping with their Jewish sisters and brothers. Written on this wall, archaeologists discovered in the 1870s, was a clear warning that that was a prohibition for Gentiles going past or fear of death. Paul says that when Christ died... He dismantled on the cross the dividing wall of hostility. And now Jew and Gentile, black and white, Asians and Latinos can come together and worship Jesus Christ. Together as one body. The great tragedy as I survey the ecclesiological landscape of the United States of America, the great tragedy of American church history is that we have tried to resurrect what Christ has dismantled, the dividing wall of hostility. Come with me to Philadelphia in 1787. There a black man has the audacity to pray at a Methodist church in the whites only section of church. Fathom that. Not even done praying. 
The whites get so infuriated at the audacity of this black man to pray in their section that they lift him up off of his feet and carry him outside. The blacks in this church become so infuriated that the next day they go to the local blacksmith shop that was vacant. They purchase it and thus began the African Methodist Episcopal denomination. What grieves me is that when you survey the historical black denominations in this country, almost all of them were started because our white brothers and sisters decided to keep up the dividing wall of hostility. Come with me. Several decades later, the Southern Baptists, because of the slave issue, break off from the General Baptists and refuse to allow blacks to join their churches. Come with me to the 1950s, in the middle of the Civil Rights Movement. Here is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as he surveys the church landscape in the South and in our country. And in melancholy tones, he says these words, the 11 o'clock hour is the most segregated hour of the week. The great tragedy of the United States church is from day one we have tried to resurrect what Christ has already dismantled. Oh Brian give me a break. It's 2013. You've got a black president. Things have changed. No they have not. If we define a multi-ethnic church the way sociologists do and that is a multi-ethnic church is defined as one in which no one ethnicity makes up more than 80% of the community. It's the 80-20 rule, very generous. If you took all of the worshiping congregations, Muslim, Christian, Mormon, whatever they may be, all of them, there are 300,000 worshiping communities in the United States right now. If you wanted to know, using the 80-20 rule, what percentage of them would qualify as multi-ethnic, only 7.5% would. If you now whittle that down and you ask, but what about Christian churches? What about those churches that name the name of Jesus Christ? That number drops from 7.5% to 2.5%. Or to say it the other way, 97.5% of the churches that will gather together under the Lordship of Jesus Christ this coming Sunday will be homogeneous. And the great tragedy is not that they're homogeneous, but the great tragedy is we're fine with it. You're not disturbed by that. You're okay with it. Every Sunday, 98% of our churches put up the dividing wall of hostility. The homogeneous church has become the norm in the United States of America. Paul, what drove you? What drove you to walk into uncomfortable places like the Hall of Tyrannus or, or Mars Hill in Athens? What drove you he says in verse 15, the work of Jesus Christ has abolished the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, here it is, that he might create in himself one new man. Our text is originally written in a language called Greek. The Greek word for new is interesting here. There are actually two Greek words for new. One is neos. Neos speaks of something that is new as it relates to time. It's the latest 2013 Ford Expedition. It's the latest iPhone 5S. It is, um, it's the latest 747 to come off the assembly line. That's neos, something that is new as it relates to time. Paul does not use the word neos here. Instead, he uses another Greek word, the word kainos, K-A-I-N-O. OS. Neos speaks of something that is new as it relates to time. Kainos speaks of something that is new as it relates to kind. The idea of kainos is invention. It is something the world has never seen before. 
Neos is the latest 747 jet. Kynos is the Wright Brothers on Kitty Hawk Beach. Neos is the latest 2013 Ford Expedition. Kynos is Henry Ford's Model T. It is the first. It is something the world has no paradigm for. When Paul says Christ has created one new man, the coming together of Jew and Gentiles, when you walked into the local church, it was the only venue in Paul's day that you would see Jew and Gentile coming together. I have no frame of reference for that. The church was unique. Homogeneity is typical. The great tragedy is people could walk into your church and I wonder, God peers over the balcony of heaven on Sunday mornings, looks at your church and goes, typical. 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 I'm here to tell you that one of the most powerful witnesses to the blood of Jesus Christ it is seeing the coming together of various ethnicities under the lordship of Jesus Christ. By God's grace, he's allowed our church in Memphis, Tennessee, solely by his grace to experience that. We, we, we planted a church 10 years ago begging God to send us to the toughest place in the country to do a multi-ethnic church in Memphis, Tennessee. We started with 26 people in a living room. I was the only piece of chocolate in the room. Now, 10 years later, there's about 2,000 of us. We're 65% white, 35% African American, and it's blowing the Memphians' mind. They never thought that could happen in the city that assassinated Dr. King. I'll never forget preaching one Sunday. I just got finished preaching. I'm standing down front, shaking hands, and I can see her face now. An old African American mother starts shuffling down the center aisle. She looks as if she was in her 80s. She squeezed my hand with all of her octogenarian strength and with tears coming down her cheeks. She said, young man, I've grown up in this city. I used to serve as a domestic. I was the help cleaning white folks' homes. I was here when they assassinated Dr. King. I was here during segregation. I was here during all the riots. And for years I have prayed for a church like this. For years I have prayed for a man like you. And with tears streaming down her face, she said, you are the answer to those prayers. I bet you, friends, she cannot recall a single word from the sermon I preached that day. How could she not recall? Because she was too busy looking to her left, looking to her right, and seeing the coming together of black and white in one kinos new man. One of the most powerful demonstrations of the blood of Jesus Christ is when we lay down our cultural preferences and we submit to his lordship. Brian, give me something practical. How do I do this? How do I help to shape and be a part of something like this? One word, intentionality. Multi-ethnic communities do not happen by accident. How does the church at Ephesus get formed? Here's how. Paul intentionally walked to the synagogue. He intentionally walked to the hall of Tyrannus. He intentionally put himself in situations where at times he was the minority. It's intentionality. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9, to the Jew, I've become a Jew. To those outside the law, they would be the Gentiles. I've become as one outside the law. And I've become all things to all men, so that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel. You, you read the end of Paul's letters, and you, 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 you read of the shout-outs, the names that he calls. Some of them are Jewish names, but some of them are Gentile names. In fact, some of them are, are black names. We know Paul had a black friend. In Romans 16, he says, say what's up to my buddy Rufus. 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 How do those friendships form? He was intentional. The man who disciples me is a good old-fashioned redneck. Loves Jesus. His name is Dennis Rainey. Here I am, an African-American man being discipled by a white, redneck hillbilly from the hills of, of Missouri. 
Dennis loves Jesus. He's made an impression on my life. But he came to me one day and he said, Brian, I figured you and I can talk about Jesus uh, while we go on a hike. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, I was thinking we could go on a hike. I said, do you mean like traversing long sections of a wilderness? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Figured we could hike. I said, Dennis, black folk don't do that. <laughs> like, like, I know some of you are thinking, oh, you're stereotyping. No, no, no. Watch the Discovery Channel <laughs> and notice how many black folk are on the Discovery Channel. Like, you want me to go walk up that mountain? For what? <laughs> and then once I'm up there, how am I getting back? <laughs> and certain news stories, you know, black people had no part in. Man gets mauled by bear. <laughs> when in your life have you ever heard of a black person getting mauled by a bear? <laughs> Some of us can remember a guy called the Crocodile Hunter. When the Crocodile Hunter died, me and all my black friends said, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, we'll wear crocodiles, we ain't gonna wrestle them. That's not how we roll. But, but, but God's been working on me through Dennis. I mean, this past December, I sat in a duck blind with a 12-gauge shotgun getting my sanctified redneck on. <laughs> he's made an impression on me. And just as he's been in some situations with me that have made him uncomfortable, I've been in some situations with him, in which I've been uncomfortable. This is the idea of what Paul gets at when he says, I have become. My time is up. I love taking my wife on trips, especially trips outside the country. A couple years ago I took her to England and then last year we went to Australia. Immediately after landing in Australia, my wife and I had this eerie feeling that we were in England. You know, Australia feels like England. 10 o'clock every day in Australia, they break for tea, just like they do thousands of miles away in England. 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Australia, they break for tea again, just like they do thousands of miles away in England. We drove down the left side of the street in Australia, just like they do thousands of miles away in England. I even watched Aborigines hit a ball with a flat little stick in a game called cricket in Australia, just like they do thousands of miles away in England. The question on the table is, how did Australia come to feel like a carbon copy of England? You know the answer to that. Hundreds of years ago, people from England boarded ships, sailed thousands of miles to a land down under, and what they did was they took the culture, customs, and preferences of a land far away called England and injected them in a land down under called Australia so that when you're in Australia, it feels like you're in England. Friends, that is the kingdom of God and the church of Jesus Christ. We fundamentally exist to take the culture, customs, and practices of a land far away called heaven and to inject them into our society not necessarily through the voting booth but through the church of Jesus Christ well what do we see in heaven John says this and they sang a new song saying worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransom people for God from, from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign on the earth John says heaven is multi-ethnic Jesus when he taught us to pray he says thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven if heaven is a multi-ethnic community, then I don't want to wait until I die to enjoy the spoils of that community. I want it now. So would you join in laboring with me to that end? Father, we love you. We bless you. We thank you. 
disturb us with this truth that you did not come to do the same old, same old, homogeneous church. You came to form one new man, the coming together of Jew and Gentile. May we give ourselves to this because it is the truth of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We're dismissed.